Okay, how's everybody doing? Woo! Love it. Awesome. Well, my name's Katie McDonald. Thanks again, Jaden, Debbie, Drew, and all the other people that have made Emma Impact possible this year. Um, as Jaden probably mentioned, I work at Greentown Labs. Greentown Labs is the nation's largest clean tech incubator. So we work with 85 of the solutionaries who are building the technologies we need to achieve a clean energy future. Uh, we work with companies ranging from C16 Biosciences, a company that's building a synthetic alternative to palm oil to decrease deforestation station, all the way to Form Energy, a company building an aqueous battery that'll fit in a shipping container that can enable solar and wind at large scales. So it's a really exciting place. It's 100,000 square feet of action-packed, awesome. Please come visit. It's almost impossible to describe unless you come visit. So. Before I invite up our incredible panelists for today's panel on philanthropy and funding the next game-changing solution, I just want to set the tone a little bit and provide you guys some context. So, as many of you probably remember, in December 2017, California experienced the Thomas Fire. This was the largest forest fire in California history, burning over 280 acres, destroying livelihoods, lives, and reminding all of us that we are on the front lines of climate change change everywhere. At current projections, just to bring it closer to home, LA, if we reach the carbon targets they believe that we will with you know, uncontrolled carbon emissions, will experience 14 times the above 90 degree days that LA currently is experiencing by 2070. That is a huge deal. This March, the Mauna Loa Observatory on top of Mauna Loa Volcano in Hawaii measured 410 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. This is more carbon than humans have ever breathed. We're setting crazy records. The Paris Agreement has put us on a path to two degree warming globally. However, if we don't really ramp back our use of fossil fuels by 2040, we have a four degree warming, warming world ahead of us. This means killer storms. This means biodiversity loss. This means extreme heat. This means suffering that is absolutely unacceptable for the human race and we cannot allow it. However, there is hope. So globally, scientists and experts in climate are saying that if we can get the money that we really, really need invested in renewables and the solutions behind the decarbonized economy, we can save ourselves. It's estimated that we're going to need about $1 trillion a year invested in renewables and other solutions for the next 22 years. To give you an idea of where we're at, right now we're investing roughly 300 billion a year. So there's a really, really big gap there. In addition, most of that money is not going to things on the early stage that could really help us do a deep decarbonization of our economy. So finding the capital to invest in those solutions is critical. We know that our government has taken a major step back, so they are not the source of that innovation and creative capital dispersion. So that brings us to our panel on philanthropy and funding next game changing solutions, we need private investors. So with that, I'm so honored to be able to invite up our panelists who are going to engage in this conversation with me. We have Sarah Carney, founder and executive director and board chair of Prime Coalition. Please come out, guys. Matthew Norton, co-founder, chairman of the Investment Committee, Prime Coalition. Alexia Kelly, founder and CEO of Electric Capital Management. And Alicia Seeger, lecturer and managing director at the Sustainable Finance Initiative at Stanford University. Give these guys a huge round of applause. Cool. Everybody comfy? Oh yeah. yeah. Good. Ready to roll. Let's go. Loungy. Okay. So first of all, I want to hand it over to Alicia in a moment. Before I do, I will say Alicia is truly a pioneer of new business models and economic frontiers. She currently leads the Sustainable Finance Initiative at Stanford, which aims to mobilize the university's asset in law, business, and innovation towards solutions to the climate challenge. Alicia, can you help kind of set some context for our audience about where you believe we are and how we're going to address this massive investment? investment gap in climate solutions. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Katie. Thank you also, Emma and uh, Debbie, for welcoming us here. It's really an honor to be with you today. Uh, so Katie did a great job setting the stage uh, in terms of the climate impacts we're seeing today, and particularly in Los Angeles. I want to set the stage uh, with a quote 
that I um, think about often and I think is very poignant for this conversation. And it was something that Christiana Figueres said. She's the chair, she was the chair of the UN triple, UNFCCC, uh, secre- uh, which is the, the organizing body that pulled together the Paris Agreement. And she said, how capital is deployed over the next five years will determine the fate of humanity. That was two and a half years ago. So the question I think for us is, uh, what did she mean by that, and what's the score? So uh, I brought notes with me so I could give you the the, the facts and data um, as the academic. I want to make sure I get those right. Don't worry, there won't be any tests. Um, but. Uh, Katie walked us through a a measuring stick, which is this trillion dollars annually through 2040. And as she said, we're measuring about $330 billion this year in global investment. Uh, We've hovered between 300 and 360 over the last three years. One thing to think about, though, is the cost of these technologies has been dropping over that period of time. So we're actually getting more for less. But we still need about three times the global investment that we're seeing today. And I don't know about you, but when I hear these kind of big numbers, I have trouble wrapping my mind around them. So I thought, as any good academic show, that I should give you some proxies. And of course, there, I I searched Google last night to give you some (laughs) some reference points. So being in LA, I thought movie ticket sales might be something you could relate to. (laughs) So last year, globally, we spent $40 billion on movie ticket sales. So about eight times movie ticket sales. It so happens that the global paints and coatings industry is 350 billion. So that's roughly what we're spending now on renewable energy and clean and smart energy technologies. In terms of the trillion dollar number, there's one company first in the world that's teetering on the brink of becoming the first company ever to have a trillion dollar market cap. That is the devices you're holding in your hands and on your wrist, that's Apple. So we're talking about the market cap of one company, um, potentially. So where is that money being spent currently right now? Primarily US and China. What's it being spent on? Primarily wind and solar. Uh, What are the types of investments? It's primarily asset finance of utility scale projects. So this is mostly debt. um, And the kinds of investments that we think about in access, public equities, that's only 2%, about 8 billion. Private equity and VC, little more than 1%, 4 billion. And that's actually the lowest number. This year is the lowest number since 2005. So um, there are lots of important to sort of think about the different types of investments that we're talking about in the 300 billion. Where is it coming from? Um, There's actually about $100 billion globally that's coming from the public sector. That's actually not in that $330 billion number. That's measured separately. On the private side, again, because it's mostly project finance, it's from project developers and banks in the form of debt. But there is a small and growing number of institutional investors and private investors who are starting to get into this opportunity. And that's what we're here to talk about today, and that's what's really exciting. So how are we going to save humanity? Um, How are we going to get that 3x? So the markets are really doing their job when it comes to wind and solar. But for critical technologies and critical geographies, there is friction. And that's what's exciting for the people here in the room today is to be identifying those points of friction with expert intermediaries like we have on stage here today and get capital flowing where it needs to flow. And I've been in this space for more than six years now looking at this problem, these gaps, and these points of friction. And I've never seen as much progress or activity as I've seen in the past year, and that's really exciting. So what I've been seeing is pension funds and endowments and high net worth individuals are really shedding their traditional structures in favor of much more dynamic access points and vehicles that allow them to uh, invest in ways that can accelerate the transition to the low carbon economy and build climate resilience while making money and future-proofing their portfolios. And I'm so excited to be here today with this panel because these are the people who are doing it. Yeah. Um, And it's really exciting. Awesome. Thank you, Alicia. So with that, Sarah Carney, you are on the ground doing hand-to-hand combat on this kind of stuff every day. You studied these philanthropy systems in your graduate work at MIT. You have led for the last five years a world-changing intermediary in this space, and you've actually worked for a private endowment and foundation yourself. So tell us about what this audience needs to know in terms of what is happening on the ground with these investments. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Carney. I serve as executive director of Prime Coalition 
Coalition. We're headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Prime is a public charity that partners with philanthropists to place charitable capital into market-based solutions to climate change. So since 2015, when we made our very first investment, um, we've mobilized just over $17 million into seven proof-of-concept investments across nine rounds of financing. And we've included more than 50 philanthropic organizations in these transactions. So 28 of those 50 amazing, courageous organizations were first-time philanthropic investors that had never used grants, recoverable grants, or program-related investments to, to support for-profit companies or projects. And 17 of them had never done anything as an interve intervention in energy or climate. Um, our investments range in size from about $500,000 up to $6 million, and each company we support promises at least one gigaton of CO2 equivalent <laughs> emissions reductions annually when they achieve commercial scale. So just for context, all wind power ever deployed globally is equivalent to one gigaton. So each company is the same as all wind power that's ever been deployed. This is a really kind of high risk, high impact reward thing that we're doing. Um, and as background, uh, my own personal journey to this field started in 2007 when I began serving as executive director on the grant making side and trustee on the endowment side of the Chisonis Family Foundation. Um, as an extremely relevant aside, because I think you'll find it interesting, during the process of being recruited by Arunas and Pam Chisonis for that job, they brought me to Los Angeles for the Emma Awards in 2007, and they said I could not have the job unless I went and talked about energy technology with Maroon 5. So, <laughs> um, so to Debbie, thank you for the mortifying and life-changing um, opportunity. <laughs> um, so the gap that we focus on at Prime is the earliest stages of company formation. Um, this is where new ventures are dying on the vine between basic science and commercial readiness. Um, companies like what I'm talking about will be pitching at the Emma Innovation Awards today and tomorrow. Um, but we know that there are thousands of these companies bubbling out of universities, national labs, and garages. And every year at Prime, we actually make a list of every one of these companies between seed and series B stage in the US. Last year, that list had 2,363 companies. So we know there's no shortage of good ideas, um, but we also know that there is a serious shortage of capital that's willing to go first to support these ideas. In 2016, Thomson Reuters and PricewaterhouseCoopers had a clean tech flag where they kept track of all traditional venture capital going into this type of company. They reported zero dollars of initial investment into anything flagged as clean tech in Q2, Q3, and Q4. Mm -hmm. So zero dollars, we know they missed some things from parties like family offices that are not compelled to share their data, but zero, that's a big goose egg as a signal um, of a very serious problem that I care deeply about as a, as a parent. Um, so our hypothesis at Prime is that philanthropists are well positioned to help fill this gap. By definition, we have multi-generational timelines. Social causes like climate change mitigation are our paramount end goal. And we have mechanisms to place grant capital into for-profit companies. Philanthropic capital in the US alone is an enormous opportunity. If we could unlock even 1% of annual grant making, it would eclipse the entire venture capital industry in the US. Mm, wow. There are 86,000 foundations in the US alone, making more than $50 billion in grants every year. There are over 1,000 sponsoring organizations for donor-advised funds that make $13 billion in grants every year. Unfortunately, of the nearly 6,000 program-related investments on record from 1998 to 2010, less than 3% pertain to anything related to science and engineering innovation across all cause areas, and less than 20 single transactions had anything to do with climate change mitigation. Wow. So I know we can do better than 20, single transactions over the next 20 years. That's the reason I'm here. And to me, it's a no-brainer. You can make a grant or a donation and never see that money again. That's a negative 100% return. Or you can make a charitable investment with Prime. It counts as a grant. You're building, um, you're building a business that can actually achieve scale, and the scale that Alicia talked about that we need to mitigate climate change. And you have the, the chance to get that money back, plus gains, to re-grant to other good causes. It's really hard to do this very well. It's nearly impossible to do alone. And that's exactly why we built Prime, to wrangle the best-in-class investment expertise that we have here in the US to help philanthropists do this really thoughtful 
thoughtfully, um, and they're volunteer volunteering their time to work hand in hand with the charitable investment community here. So we've had courageous leaders that have partnered with us so far at Prime. The Will and Jada Smith Family Foundation um, came in very early, and and you can, if you can imagine it, you know I could. Five years ago, never imagined the Will and Jada Smith Family Foundation supporting a grid capacity energy storage company, or the Autodesk <laughs> Foundation supporting a reverse osmosis membrane company to help make desalination more energy efficient, or the Boston Foundation supporting a company in Chicago that takes waste heat from power plants and converts it into electricity. These are just kind of unusual pairings that are very difficult to put together, but it's exactly the types of unexpected partnerships and bold leaders that are really walking the walk rather than just talking the talk. And th these are the kind of combinations that are going to help us actually mitigate climate change. Awesome. You know, while we're on this topic, Matthew Norton, um, I'm, I would love to hear your perspective because so Matthew Norton, you are a co- founder of Prime Coalition, the firm that Sarah co-founded with you. Um, you have also been doing hand-to-hand -hand combat as a clean tech investor who's invested in everything from Nest, who's heard of Nest, right, um, to Wright Electric, an electric airplane company, um, and you're currently leading up investments of Prime. So can you tell us, can you maybe open it up and tell us a s kind of sexy Maroon 5 story <laughs> about one of the firms that Prime has been engaged with? So I don't know about sexy Maroon 5 stories, but... Uh, <laughs> I will say that it is wonderfully refreshing to be on an investment panel that is not a bunch of dudes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yay! <laughs> so look, uh, my training's in venture capital, and I learned the business at a firm called Venrock that's arguably the world's oldest venture capital firm, originally the venture arm of the Rockefeller family. And I went there to invest in breakthrough energy technology companies. Nest, who Katie mentioned, was an extraordinary outcome acquired by Google. But every Monday morning when I went into my colleagues, I got super frustrated because it seemed like there was an inverse correlation between how disruptive and impactful on climate a seed stage company was that I brought to the table and our likelihood to invest in it because they were just a little bit too risky and a little bit too early for venture investors who had stars in their eyes from the likes of Instagram and Snapchat. After failing to get those investments done one too many times, uh, I met Sarah and she described exactly what you heard beforehand. There's $600 billion sitting in US family foundations alone. That's four times the size of the entire venture capital asset class. And she told me if we could have a lever just to redirect a few degrees, basis points of investment from that pool, we could transform how you would fund early stage energy technology companies. Now, one of those companies that I had seen at Venrock is an energy storage company called Quidnet Energy. Uh, and its aim is to time shift wind and solar power and make it dispatchable so you can turn it on and off through energy storage. And their mechanism for doing that is not batteries. Batteries are really good. They're great for electric cars. They may be too expensive for storing energy at grid scale. Their mechanism is storing energy in pressurized water in underground geologic reservoirs, ironically drawing on the toolkit developed over 40 years in the oil and gas industry and subverting that for clean energy. I saw that investment when I was at Venrock, and I brought it to my colleagues, and we looked at it and thought, you know what, this is a great idea, and we would love to fund it in three or four years. Somebody else has to show up first and retire this early risk for it to be compatible with us. And you know what? That same group of entrepreneurs, they went to Kleiner Perkins, they passed. They went to Sequoia, they passed. Everybody passed. And the company just hung in limbo. And when Sarah and I co-founded Prime in 2014, we brought three breakthrough neglected investments out to our philanthropic network. Quidnet was one of them. Uh, and to our surprise and delight, it was the one that received the most interest. And we put together a $500,000 seed round, tiny amount of money, uh, that involved the Will and Jada Smith Family Foundation. Big ups to Jaden for seeing this vision uh, and articulating it really clearly. He can tell that story better than I can. Um, there he is. And then three other philanthropic givers. And we made that financing in June of 2015. A month later, we were in the field testing it out and seeing if the company's computational models worked in real life at a reservoir in Central Texas. And happily, it did. We actually exceeded the figures of merit we needed to show that we could do storage five to 10 times lower cost than lithium-ion batteries. 
We then did a second round of financing about the same size, but now about half philanthropic money and about half just normal commercial investment capital that was convinced there was something here and willing to come in, uh, where we demonstrated this technology working over nine months and many dozens of cycles. Uh, I then introduced a, a CEO to the business as a full-time leader, an extraordinary young guy named Joe Zhou. We raised a final round to give him enough headway to raise a real round of financing. This time it was only 20% philanthropic capital and 80% normal investment capital. And I'm happy to announce that last week, uh, Quidnet closed its Series A round of financing, $6.4 million. Uh, co-led by a long-term billion-dollar investment partnership between multiple climate-focused billionaires, uh, names that you would know, and Evoke Innovations, which is a Canadian oil and gas strategic. We're going to use that money to go out and build our first commercial plant with a real utility buying the power without price support and without any subsidy. Amazing. That. <laughs> That is the power of philanthropic capital, to unlock things no one else can unlock. Mm -hmm. And that's the power that's in many of your hands. Mm -hmm. So that would have been an official drop the mic moment if he had a mic, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. Very good. Thanks, Matthew. So Alexia, you are, have not only been a US diplomat that helped deliver us the Paris Agreement, you're also a philanthropist in your own right and a financial capital markets expert through your work with the Microgrid Investment Accelerator. And going off what Matthew said, you know, a huge part of what you're doing is trying to finance stuff that's going to be in the ground, making an impact on day one. That's where we hope a lot of these technologies will come. That's where you're playing right now. So what, what's your perspective on all this? Yeah, thanks, Katie, and good afternoon or good morning, I guess, still, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Hollywood talking to people we don't normally talk to. Uh, this is an incredibly important part of getting this problem solved, is forging the new and innovative partnerships among non-traditional actors. And it, I have to say it's really refreshing to be up on a panel of folks who are all equally focused um, on really solving this early stage innovation gap. Um, because the players that be in the incumbents aren't getting it done for all of the reasons that have been so well laid out here. Um, we really need organizations and entities and individuals who are willing to put relatively small amounts of capital to work, to test, to innovate, to drive change, and ultimately to drive the scale of the low carbon economy revolution. Um, so I had the privilege of working for a number of years at the US State Department in the Climate Change Office, managing our work on low emissions development strategies with about 25 developing countries globally, and had the opportunity to spend about four years on an airplane flying around the world talking with developing country governments about the way in which they're thinking about achieving their economic and social development objectives in the context of climate change. And I will tell you that they are. Um, and when we were doing this work in you know, 2010, um, I would sit down, I sat down with the minister of Malawi and had a conversation with him and he said, look, our economic infrastructure and our energy infrastructure is almost entirely dependent on international foreign assistance, on donor assistance. And I have the Chinese knocking on my door telling me that they're going to build me a coal-fired power plant. I know that in 10 years, this technology is going to be completely obsolete, that it's going to poison our people, and that it's not going to get us where we need to go over the longer term. But renewable energy still costs more than that coal fire power plant, and there's nobody to finance it in my country. And he said, I have to build the coal plant because my people need power today. My people deserve access to energy today, and that is my priority. And so I'm gonna make that happen because I have no other choice. And that is now, thankfully, five years later, a false choice in many respects in these markets. Distributed renewable energy generation technologies have reduced so much in cost that we can now go head to head with traditional fossil fuel based infrastructure and build out a more distributed, more resilient, more affordable energy system that can provide sustainable energy for people who have never had access to electricity ever in their lives for the first time. And they're doing it with state-of-the-art technologies. They're using mobile money on their cell phones to charge their smart meters that are linked to their solar panels on their mud huts. Africa is poised to leapfrog America and the rest of the world in terms of the sophistication and low carbon nature, as well as climate resilience of their energy systems within the next decade. But I will tell you that there is a dramatic capital flow problem. 
nobody wants to invest in Malawi. It's high risk, it's an unknown market, it offers opportunities that people don't understand but also aren't prepared to move on. And so the work that we do at Electric Capital Management and through the Microgrid Investment Accelerator, which similarly was seed funded by an innovative and risk-taking investment from Facebook, uh, from their newly uh, developed energy access program, is to help blend capital and bring philanthropic capital to bear to reduce the risk to bring in those large private investors who take a pass on every single one of these companies that are building these microgrids and building these distributed energy systems in Africa because the risks are too high. And so our work as a community is to really figure out how do we build those new and innovative partnerships? How do we bring the cool kids to partner with us nerds to get this information out in front of the people who are really able to bring it to scale? Um, and so the work that we do is really figuring out both what are the mechanics of actually blending the finance, of actually bringing those investments to bear, and also the opportunity of forging those new partnerships that are going to accelerate and push this issue to the center of the global stage so that it receives the attention that it deserves. Awesome. Thank you. So unfortunately, we are out of time. I want to convey to all of you, as you can imagine, this is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the juicy opportunity each of these individuals is working to address. It would be crazy to not take them up on a dinner date or a lunch date today, <laughs> so please tap their brains later. Um, this is incredibly fulfilling work, and it's so needed. Thank you all for being here. Round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.